I'm so excited for our conversation with Portia Munson and Catherine Schneider this evening. Um, so just to introduce both of these wonderful experts in their respective fields, uh, Portia Munson is a visual artist who works in a range of media, including photography, painting, sculpture, and installation, and focuses primarily on environmental and cultural themes seen from a feminist perspective. Munson's work has been the focus of more than 20 solo exhibitions and has been shown in major public and private spaces, including Mass MoCA, the New Museum, Albany International Airport, Wave Hill, and Bryant Park Subway Station in collaboration with the Metropolitan Transit Authority. Her memento mori mandalas, mandalas for arresting monumental silk banners are currently on view at Olana in conjunction with Cross Pollination, Martin Johnson Heed, Frederick Church, Thomas Cole, and Our Contemporary Moment, a collaborative exhibition created by, created by Thomas Cole, National Historic Site, the Olana Partnership at Olana State Historic Site, and Crystal Bridges Museum of American Art in Bentonville, Arkansas. That show opens this weekend at Olana and at Thomas Cole National Historic Site. So be sure to stay tuned and for more information on how to come see that show. We're very excited for Catherine to join us for a conversation about Portia's work. Catherine Schneider grew up in Claverack, New York, went to Hudson High, and then attended Cornell and Princeton Universities, where she completed a PhD. She taught college courses in general biology and ornithology at the University of Richmond and later at Hudson Valley Community College. In 1986, she returned to Columbia County and for 14 years directed the New York Natural Heritage Program, a biodiversity inventory program run jointly by the Nature Conservancy and the New York State Department of Environmental Conservation. As a consultant, she conducted bird surveys for the US Fish and Wildlife Service. She is past president of the New York State Ornithological Association, a former member of the Columbia County Environmental Management Council and a Columbia Land Conservancy volunteer. She currently co-chairs the steering committee for New York's third Breeding Bird Atlas Project, which I'm excited for her to share a little bit about with us today. Catherine's 2018 publication, Birding the Hudson Valley, is an engaging site guide that provides encouragement for bird enthusiasts to expand their horizon and also showcases the different species of the Hudson Valley region. So with fur without further ado, I would love to turn things over to Portia to give us a brief introduction to her work and to the pieces that are currently on view at Olana. Hello, um, I am going to start by showing you examples of my work and uh, talking a little bit about my practice. So this is uh, an early work of mine called Ping Project Table, and um, I'm showing this work. I'm showing some earlier work and work that I, some of the larger work I've done over time to just give you a sense of how I work. Uh, and I feel like the, the common theme throughout my work is that, including what's the work that's up at Olana, is that I'm I'm gathering information and observing the world around me. So I'm, I'm seeing um, whether it's plastic trash or things that I'm seeing in the grocery store or dead birds that I see on the side of the road. I, I collect things and I look at them and I um, try to make sense of the world through carefully organizing and arranging and sort of thinking about these objects. So um, here's a couple of other details of this um, ping project table. And I basically collected everything that I came across that was produced in the uh, mass produced in the color pink and organized it um, in themes and um, just sort of was trying to look at and think about I started this when I was a much younger woman. I was thinking about who am I as a woman as defined by these colors and these mass, this, this plastic stuff made in this color, this mass produced stuff. Um, and then I'm also, I work in many different ways at the same time. So um, this is a painting uh, and I've, I've always been a painter. This is a, a still life um, oil painting and I paint objects the size that they actually are. And I work kind of simultaneously on gathering things, arranging them, drawing, painting, um, all different ways to sort of look at the world around us and kind of figure out and sort of understand um, what I'm seeing. This piece that you're looking at right now is called Her Coffin, and it's made up of thousands of little pink plastic objects that I've arranged um, sort of in a color, like I've kind of ombre them, like arranged them in shades of pink. Uh, and I'm thinking about with this piece, um, I, was, I it was sort of started with thinking about the, the um, pink ribbon campaign in relation to breast cancer awareness. And I was thinking about how it was really ironic that so many 
um, objects were being made in this color pink or the, or the containers, the plastic wraps had the pink ribbon on them and uh, how plastic is so connected to, um, to our health and really a carcinogen um, and breast or just a cancer causing uh, material. This is a detail of that piece. Here's a, paint, a painting of a wig, another sort of found object focusing in on that. This is a pink project bedroom. And this is made up of, again, of many, many found pink objects, pink baby onesies or just onesies are um, covering the ceiling. Pink lingerie and dresses are making the wallpaper on the dress on the walls and shoes on the floor. And I was really thinking about how we're really bombarded with so much stuff and so much information and so much a pressure to consume. Um, and also certain pressures about identity and about what it means to be um, a citizen in this country and also what it means to be a female or you know, um, many different things. Um, again, I kind of, you know, here's a painting called Wonder and um, I'm just examining different objects that I come across and thinking about them. I did this painting while I was considering and making this piece, which is called The Garden. And the garden is made up of all of these mass produced floral and garden related objects that uh, are sort of more associated with women and ideas of beauty, but also flowers are also connected with um, funerals and death. And so I was kind of thinking about this painting as this commodification of beauty, but also about death in relation to this, um, you know, like mass consumption and um, stuff that we're kind of bombarded with. And here's a vanity detail from the garden. Um, this is a pink, I mean a pink, a green plastic skull uh, that I did a painting of. So this is an oil painting called, um, just called skull, a light up skull. And this is a piece that is called lawn and it's made up of thousands of found green plastic objects. And I was really thinking about, this was from the early 2000s. And this, this piece is lawn and it's meant to sort of take up it's the size is variable. So it sort of is one size for one gallery space or one other kind of exhibition space. And it's just thinking about this um, manufactured idea of lawn and of, you know, of kind of thinking about many different things, but about how many chemicals are produced in order to like make perfect lawns. And then this kind of greenwashing of all of this stuff that's put in this color, made in this color green. Uh, in order to sell it as something that's, um, you know, like environmentally friendly or something that would go well in your yard, but it's all this plastic, green plastic stuff. And this piece on the same theme is called her, uh, called um, sarcophagus. And the sarcophagus is filled with thousands of found green plastic objects that again, I've arranged in this um, color order and just, I'm kind of, and with this piece, trying to imagine the end of plastic and uh, that, you know, when, um, when my grandchildren, when my grandparents were children, there was no plastic in the world. And I guess I'm kind of trying to imagine like when my grand, great grandchildren or grandchildren are around, maybe plastic will become something that is just, um, you know, like we'll just see as in museums or something that had happened in the past, oops. Uh, and this is a piece that's called um, time, uh, time capsule, um, Greenpeace time capsule. So I'm, uh, or, actually no, I have that wrong, sorry. This is future fossil. And um, this again, I'm also thinking about um, so many of this plastic stuff is really, can just be used once is like throw out like stuff, but it's really having a huge environmental impact. So I'm, I'm thinking about with that with, um, with, with really all of my work, this is a painting of tomatoes. And um, with this piece, I was just, and other piece, similar paintings and pieces, I'm thinking about how hard it is to purchase food these days, to go to the supermarket and to not come home 
that you can't come home without bringing home plastic and that immediately gets thrown out and the tragedy of that. Uh, this piece is called Reflecting Pool. And um, again, I'm just thinking about this color and what, how this color is used to sell things that are, that are mainly associated with water. First, I thought it was a color that was more associated with boys, like pink for girls and blue for boys. But then as I gathered this, this found trash, I realized that so much of this color um, was really about water. And this piece is called Flood. Um, and this painting here is just thinking about this, this strange sort of combination of nature and, and what we do to nature. Here's a detail of Flood. It's all this found blue plastic. And here, now um, I'm turning to the, um, the work that's at Olana. So this image, Sharp Shin Talk, is one of the images that's suspended between trees at Olana. And um, with this work, I, I don't know, for, I've, for, at first it started with, I would drive around and see so many dead squirrels or creatures and I would sort of keep a journal of like how many, you know, how many squirrels um, on this day did I see on the side of the road or what kind of birds, like documenting all the dead creatures that I would find. And then I began just occasionally when I see a really perfect tragic um, creature on the side of the road, I will take it home and uh, scan it, surround it with, I'm an avid gardener and have a large garden and I would um, gather things from my garden and sort of make a document of that day, like documenting this, this creature um, that often it seemed very needlessly um, perished because of our actions you know, speeding along these highways or um, that sort of thing. So this is a bluebird that was found in the winter. And so there were no colorful flowers. These were seed pods. Um, here's a snake that I found over in Columbia County. And um, this is a, an installation view of a show that I had at PPOW called Reflecting Pool. And it had that blue piece reflecting pool in one gallery and the other gallery I had made dandelion wallpaper uh, that I hung these different um, bird memento mori mandalas on top of this um, dandelion wallpaper. And with the dandelion wallpaper, I was thinking about lawns again and how um, tragic it is that so many golf courses and lawns, they try to get rid of uh, a beautiful flower like a dandelion that's really like a sun, it's like a, like reflecting the sun back and there's so many nutrients that it's you know that it has this very long tap root and it brings nutrients up to the soil above and so it's kind of thinking about those kind of interrelated things this is a, um, a ruby-throated hummingbird um, that someone found and um, gave to me and I made this scan and this is going to be in the interior uh, on a print on the interior part of the exhibition at Olana um, and here is, um, I'm just, the name is just escaping me of this bird, but um, yeah, beautiful, tragic bird that was a friend found in front of a large plate glass window, which are so treacherous for birds. Um, so I just have a few more just to share. So with this work, I'm trying to honor these creatures, and I hope that my work at Olana really is able to, that the viewers of the work there will really understand that this work is meant as like, you know, um, something that I'm doing to like notice these creatures that are just needlessly dying because of some of the things that, that we're um, doing, dying before they normally would because of uh, cars and windows and poisons in our environment. Um, so I'm just, I'm, I wanna just really, bring attention to and honor these creatures. Um, and then I've done some subway work, uh, some pieces on uh, public pieces, and, which is so exciting to have work like the work at Alana or the work on the New York City subways where um, you're able to just reach so many different people, more people and not necessarily an art going audience, but just your, your average uh, daily 
um, commuter or traveler. Uh, and this work I should say is in Brooklyn on the D line at the Fort Hamilton Parkway station. Um, this was um, below Bryant Park, these mandalas. This was at Albany Airport, currently in this location, about to be in a different location there. Um, here's another mandala called a butterfly bush. And here, sometimes I make these images without features, just with the flowers from my garden. Just to sort of um, thinking about celebrating life and how fleeting life is for all of us. Like flowers live this incredible life, but it's so short and beautiful. And so it's kind of meant as like a celebration. This is a piece that's currently up at Katzbahn. And um, then here are two pieces that are at Olana up between the trees. And I'm just so appreciative and grateful to Olana uh, and the Olana partnership for having the opportunity to share this work and show it at Olana. Okay. Thank you. Thank you so much, Portia. The feeling is most definitely mutual. Um, so with that, I, I just I thank you again. It was wonderful to kind of see the kind of lineage of your work and how it's developed, but I would love to turn things over to Catherine. Um, you know, as someone with a scientific and ecological understanding of many of the bird species that Portia highlighted in her presentation, Catherine, I'm wondering if you would want to respond to these works in the context of your own expertise and in some of the things that you're doing uh, currently. So Portia, Catherine, I think we should both have you on video for our presentation or our conversation. And Catherine, please, um, I'd love to hear your thoughts. Well, as an ornithologist, the first thing that strikes me about the, I can speak mostly to the birds, but a little bit about some of the other, um, other animals that are in um, this art is most of them are dead and I, I deal with living organisms so I immediately, the question that comes to mind is how did they die? Mm -hmm. And um, we have, many of these are fairly common species and we have some knowledge of them. So the sharp chin hawk, for example, and the uh, barred owl, they're both forest dwelling predators and they make their living eating other animals. So the, the barred owl is a rodent eater and of course it hunts at night and it tends to live in the forest and hunt for rodents and clearings. They have an unfortunate habit of, of uh, hunting on the edges of the, of the woods, which are often roadside edges. And many, many of them are hit by cars. And I would be willing to bet that yours was as well. Um, Sharpshin hawks um, are bird predators and they're active by day. Um, they are, have developed a talent for taking birds off feeders, bird feeders, and as a result, they often hit windows because glass is not part of their normal environment. They see reflected habitat in the windows and, and they very often strike windows for that reason. So one of the things I've tried to do is to educate people about how they can place their feeders in the ways that will not allow birds to see them as habitat. So the rule of thumb is to place a feeder within about three feet of a window or with about 30 feet from a window. So if they're 30 feet from a window, they won't get up, they won't get up enough speed usually to, to hit a window. And if they're, well, if they're close, they won't get up enough speed. And if they're 30 feet away, then you can still see them, but they won't you can see the habitat in the windows as well. And there are lots of other things you can do. There are decals and things like that that you can put on windows. But uh, the Cecropia moths are, are, are beautiful moths and, and they're, um, they're declining. They're members of the giant silkworm moth family. And they're, and they're the, yeah, I, I, Portia, I don't know if you highlighted that um, piece in your slideshow presentation, but there's a wonderful, um, one of the wonderful banners on view is of this, this circopria moth, so yeah. They're among my favorites, they're beautiful. And they, um, but they're attracted to lights. And of course, the more lights we have in our environment, the more they are gonna be attracted to these lights. And and they're, they're just um, taken by bats. They're, the bats have figured this out so many of them are getting eaten by bats and there are campaigns to reduce the amount of lighting, at least direct lighting more at the ground and to use motion detectors on lights so that we have a more of a dark environment that's appropriate for moths to do what they do. Hmm. So. Yeah, it's so interesting. I feel like, um, you know, something that you said, Portia, is 
about your work is this idea of trying to honor the animals and honor their lives. But something that I think your work also does and in your response, Catherine, it, it bring, comes to my mind is highlighting how much of a effect human intervention and hum, human kind of lived experience has on these species and these populations. I wonder if either of you could talk a little bit more about that and about um, kind of how you grapple with that in both of your own very different lines of work. Well, I, what I do is I teach people. I try, I mean, I'm a teacher at heart and uh, a conservationist at heart. So I try and explain why these, what these hazards are for, for birds and other kinds of wildlife. And, and because uh, we, we're part of the solution. I mean, we have, we can easily uh, accommodate most of these. Most of them aren't out there to kill these birds or, or moths. I mean, it's an accident most of the time and it's the way, way we live. And if we, just the way we live many times we can coexist with these species yeah i think i do some of the same like trying to um you know share window stickers and talk about that um i really would like to keep i feel like by saying things and repeating things maybe you're more likely to have them happen <laughs> and so one thing that i really would love to see happen uh, more it does happen in some places are our, our, our ways of animals being able to pass under or over highways mm -hmm. um, and you know to have like animal corridors in places so that so that animals can um, you know can pass through without being hit by cars. Um, I also just think being really you know opening your eyes and having more of an awareness and I, I hope that with my work I'm I really want to like I I just feel like there's some, we get so used to things, like we get so used to seeing, you know, a dead possum on the side of the road or something like that. And I'm trying with my work to sort of slow down a little bit and look at it and hopefully make other people do, you know, something like that, like think about like slowing down and um, literally trying to slow down. I mean, it's so tragic just recently, I. I, you know, I often will stop and help a turtle across the road. And that's a great thing to do. Like people should really do that. And I recently saw on a little back road, a, an injured, a, you know, tragically injured turtle. And I was like, what was the driver thinking? Like, I guess they didn't see it, but it's like really important, you know, to, to sort of um, pay attention to our, to our environment. And so that we can keep these treasures, you know, that we have. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think it's something that you you both kind of brought up in your in your in our conversation so far is this idea of, you know, this observation, this looking, this slowing down and paying attention. And it strikes me that it's something that's tied to both of your lines of work. I mean, at Alana, we're often thinking about the intersections of church's work and science and some of the 19th century scientists um, and, and the interrelationships there, but it really strikes me that contemporaneously, there is such a connection between the artistic process, the process of a contemporary artist, and the process of a, you know, a conservationist or an ecologist. And so I wonder if um, either of you could speak to some of those intersections and, and where you see some of those similarities. I think observation and close looking is definitely one of them, but I am curious about what, you, what both of you think. Well, as a scientist, I mean, we ask questions and we do research using the scientific method. And the scientific method depends on observation. If you can't observe it, you can't answer questions using the scientific mm -hmm. method. So there are basically two steps in the scientific method that use observation. One is just formulating the questions in the first place. The second is the data gathering stage where you have to make careful measured observations. You can't just do you know, willy nilly observations. They have to be very careful ones. Um, so I think observation is really important in answering scientific questions. and learning more and, and when we do, when we gather data, of course, it's what's at the root of scientific research. We, we learn new things because of the ways we gather data. I would just say that as an ornithologist, um, I think it strikes me that one of the big differences may be that in art, I think most of the observation is visual. And as an ornithologist, I do an awful lot of listening with my ears because birds <laughs> sing. And we can do a great, we can learn a great deal about birds by doing um, observations about song because birds are identifiable by song. They you can actually figure out population sizes by using point counts, the number of singing males are mostly the singing birds. So we can actually 
answer scientific questions using auditory observations as well. Hmm. And it, when you were talking about the scientific method, you know, it, it, when you said wonder in your in your conversation, Portia, in your when you were presenting on your work, you said that you're often driven by wonder, and I feel like that in itself um, is something that you need as a scientist as well. I don't know if you want to talk a little bit more about that, Portia, in your in the context of your own work. Yeah, I mean, I think I think like part of being a scientist and also an artist has to do with being curious too, like being curious about what's around you and wanting to discover and learn and know more about what's around you. Um, I think that's, that's like, you know, the best thing you can do. But I, I, I kind of sometimes think of myself as being kind of an artist, like an, an, a homemade artist version of a scientist, because I'm not clearly using a strict scientific method. But um, I do when I, for example, when I'm making my mandalas with or without creatures in them, I'm documenting a day. So it's something that is really interesting to me. Like this bird died on this day, the day that these particular flowers were blooming. And it's also really interesting over time to see that on this day in June that I found this bird and made this image with these flowers blooming, I've really seen over time that on that day, on a different year, some of those flowers might not be blooming then. Like, things really like you can see different patterns and how things um, change, you know, and how things can uh, more recently, you know, you notice things maybe blooming earlier or um, I don't know. So there's, there's, you know, I, I'm always sort of noting like, what is the, what is the date that I've, you know, that I've made this piece and that I found um, this bird and these flowers were blooming in this place at that time, so. Yeah, it was interesting to hear that part of your process started with a kind of a note taking of birds that you had or, or animals mm -hmm. that you had observed as as dead mm -hmm. or, or these dead species. What made you kind of pivot and change direction and, and want to capture that data in a visual way? Um, well, it actually quite it happened because a um, a close relative of mine who I was very fond of passed away. She was an elderly woman in her 90s. And she was always someone who was always very curious and very young and inspiring. And I was trying to write a letter to the family acknowledging how much she meant to me. Mm -hmm. And I just couldn't, I'm not a, that's not my thing. I can't really write things like that. And I was walking around my garden and these images of the flowers and things came together and started making mandalas. Like this one behind me was one of the first ones I made after that. And so I started thinking about the fleeting lives of humans and the beauty and fleeting lives of um, flowers mm -hmm. on a really different time scale, but also like beautiful and then gone. And, um, and so then I just, when I would see these different creatures on the side of the road, like literally one year there was maybe a bumper nut crop or something and there were so many squirrels and then there were so many dead squirrels on the road and it just was really, striking and I, I think I have a lot of empathy for these animals and so I'll see something like that and I'll just get this like pain you know mm. and I just wanted to um just the idea of people just getting used to it like I said and just driving by and not paying attention to what our actions are doing I mean that's sort of a metaphor like driving past something and just like oh yeah there's another <laughs> you know without really paying attention so I think I think that's what kind of made me do that start that work yeah thank you for sharing that's a wonderful <laughs> story I mean just hearing kind of how these this this visual imagery is is a call to action really um I think <laughs> that that's something that we've talked a little bit about and you know I wonder Catherine if there's if there's something we can take away from listening um to our conversation today or from viewing Portia's work what are what are some of these ways that we can kind of be called to act? How can we protect some of these mm -hmm. bird species either locally or, or throughout the North America? Because I know there's been a rapid decline of, of species in the past couple of years. I think one of the most important things we can do is educate ourselves mm -hmm. about how these animals die. And the, the, some of the scientific reports that have come out about the decline in bird numbers over the last um, 30 years or so have, have all documented the major sources of loss I mean, habitat loss is one of the biggest things. I mean, 
roads are part of habitat loss. Um, but just educating yourself to know what these organisms need and how they, how all of um, these different organisms are connected in various ways. Um, I was struck by the, I, I looked up a little bit about Sopropion moss because I, I like that particular image so much. And uh, I, I learned a little bit more about them. They, they're, these giant silkworm moss, uh, there are many different kinds, are in decline all over the world. And lights seem to be one of the main problems, but they're an important cog in the wheels of mother nature. Um, they have, if I could just share my screen for a minute, I wanted to show you a yeah, please. Uh, picture here. I have a, um, this is a um, Cecropia moth caterpillar. And you can see it's a pretty good size caterpillar. And so one of these moths lays about a hundred eggs and each of those eggs becomes a caterpillar like this. And this is, and I don't know, I don't think most people know that that baby birds have to eat caterpillars or at least animal food. They don't eat seeds. Their parents must feed them insects for the most part or insect larvae and caterpillars are a big part of it. And they cannot grow, they, they need protein. They can't grow without eating this kind of food. So when, when they, um, when the Scropia moths die, this is a major part of their, not just, not just Scropia moths, but moths in general. You may not think that the loss of a moth is a big deal, but it is a really big deal to birds because there are fewer and fewer caterpillars around and the birds need that food for their young. And I don't, I don't think that um, people deliberately go out to kill animals much anymore. There are, there are hunters, of course, but I don't think people really want to kill animals. I think they just don't understand. Mm -hmm. I was at a conservation area uh, in Columbia County. It's a grassland where there, there are grassland birds breeding in the grasses around there on the ground. These are bobolinks. Grassland birds have become quite rare because they get mowed a lot of the time where there are hay fields. But this particular conservation there, area, they're managing the land for grassland birds. So there are bobolinks everywhere. There are meadowlarks everywhere. It's just a wonderful place. And there's, a guy, there's signage to stay on the trails. There was a guy there throwing a stick for his dog. Mm -hmm. He was running out through the grassland and undoubtedly encountering nests and disturbing the birds. And I don't think he meant to, to hurt the birds. I just think he didn't understand that what he was doing could, could destroy nests. You know? Yeah. I think most people are that way. They just need to know more. Yeah, and I think in this time, you know, at Olana, we're often talking about how wonderful it's been to see so many people seek refuge in the outdoors and coming to, you know, Olana to spend time with their family during the pandemic, but that kind of awareness of our impact and of how we are impacting these species around us, I think um, that educational piece is definitely a, a vitally important thing and one that we're thinking about all the time. Mm -hmm. Something that um, I just wanted to, to chat with you. So we're, if, if anyone has questions as we're conversing, please feel free to chime in. We're gonna be, submit them to the Q&A. We're gonna be turning things over to audience Q&A in a few moments. Um, but something that Portia, you've said about your work is that a closer look at the subject reveals hidden secrets. And I think that this is such an interesting idea. And so I was wondering if there's one hidden secret that either of you have uncovered or noticed in the context of your work. Um, Portia, I'm thinking just about how experiential and how observational your pieces are. If there's anything that you've discovered that has stuck with you. And Catherine, um, same question to you. So whoever wants to chime in first. Well, I think it's going to be hard for me to just say one thing. I feel like there's, uh, I think that really look, the scanner, you can, you scan and then you can zoom in. And so just to see like the complex, complex structure of feathers mm -hmm. on birds and how they have like little teeny tiny feathers, you know, like on their legs or on their faces or, you know, like and just the different kinds, like that's really amazing. And then another sort of not so nice thing that I've discovered is that often the birds that I find have quite a lot of ticks on them. Like mm -hmm. they're, I, you know, they're one of the, it, 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 it they, the ticks travel on everything. <laughs> and um, that's, that was like, wow, you know, the, they're, they're coming on the birds too. 
Mm -hmm. so. mm -hmm. Yeah, Portia, could you talk a little bit more about this process of, of using the scanner? So I think um, that's something that I think you mentioned briefly in your overview. Oh, oh yeah, yeah, I should have gone over that a little more. So um, what I do is I put, I don't have a lid on my scanner and my scanner is in a small room that's painted a very dark blue color mm -hmm. and that I can completely close off and shut out all the light from that room. And so I lay um, the flowers and the bird on this scanner and then scan it. And the scanner has a very, very shallow depth of field. So it, it's a very even light and a very sort of um, even the depth of field. So it just uh, takes a picture of the things that are at a certain mm -hmm. distance. So anything further away just kind of falls away from the, from the image. And uh, it's just, a, it's just, I just love the look of the scanner. It's, it's sort of like a different way of making a still life. You know, mm -hmm. it's, really, um, it's really a wonderful tool to use. I do wanna also say that I am aware that, um, and I want everyone to know that these, these wild birds are all protected and it's really not okay to just, you know, they're protected so that people aren't killing them on purpose and like selling them or doing things with them. And, um, you know, so I'm very aware of that. And I try to make sure that I'm passing on any of the birds that I find so that they can go on and be, you know, used more in science and use as part of research. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. yeah. And Catherine, I know, I don't, I don't know if you want to answer the, the hidden secret question, but well, also to think a little bit about, um, you know, how, how, how are people, I'm curious about how people are researching birds currently, but Catherine, I'll let you answer the first question first. Well, there are, there are a huge amount of scientific research going on right now, but I'm um, uh, deeply involved in a project called the New York State Breeding Bird Atlas. And if I could share my screen just one more time. Yeah, of course. I want to uh, show you um, next time. So I'm involved in coordinating a statewide project that is a citizen science project. Bird watchers from all of the state are involved in this project. And it is a project to take a snapshot basically of the breeding distribution of birds. This is the third time a project like this has been done in New York State. It's been, they're done every 20 years and they're five year long projects. And what we do is we divide the state up into three, three mile squares. And we send volunteers out there and we ask them to go to one of these three mile square blocks and document the birds that are breeding there. And they can do it in different ways. They can do it by seeing birds building a nest, by seeing young. This is a kind of result you can get from this kind of a citizen science project. This is from the second atlas and it shows the distribution of osprey in New York where mm -hmm. these birds are breeding. We can do this for all 250 so breeding bird species in New York state because of this project. And so I think projects like this that make people aware of birds, that help them learn about birds and contribute to environmental review when development is taking and habitat is being lost are really important, is a really important project. And this is kind of the way I, I uh, deal with the loss of species when I see so many animals dying. At least I feel like by providing this kind of background and, and science um, to, to the decision-making process, we are to some extent mitigating the damage we've done. Hmm. So people can, so everyday citizens can participate. We can kind of go out and take the, take this observational eye that uh, Portia is illustrating in her work and that you're participating in and go out and track this information. As long as you can identify birds just a little. I mean, <laughs> I mean we uh -huh. have contributed to this project. Oh, that's wonderful. Yeah, so maybe we can add um, some information on that in the post-program email so people can participate if they, if they um, desire. So Catherine, when we're sp speaking a little bit about bird species, um, I know that in your book you introduce a brief geological history of the region to talk a little bit about how humans have affected, have affected the region um, and have affected the environment of birds. And I know we've talked a little bit about the kind of the human impact, mm -hmm. but is, is there anything kind of that you want to make sure that we know? I know we talked a little bit about some, some other um, window strikes and some other kind of um, impact that humans have, but is there anything else that we're, that we're leaving out in this, in this conversation? Well, just 
just the habitat loss. I mean, one mm -hmm. of the things is habitat loss is the, is the primary cause of the loss of birds from different perspectives, but um, that's, that is the main take home message, but there are, there are lots of other things we can do. Like for example, those caterpillars that I pointed out as being so important to breeding birds, they depend on native plants. They don't do as mm -hmm. well on exotic plants that are introduced. So when people are gardening, I can encourage them to plant native plants. And there's a whole movement now to, it's called native plants prefer generally, and the birds prefer them because they have more, there's this interconnectedness in nature. The, the, the insects that, that, um, that lay eggs and that eat those plants and provide the caterpillars for birds are, are relying on native plants. They don't do as well on things like dahlias, which I love, but uh, dahlias, you don't find very many caterpillars on them. They make great flowers, but they're not providing food for other animals in the environment. Mm -hmm. That's so, it's such an, you know, I think bringing that idea to mind of how interconnected everything is, you know, I think the first visual that jumps to mind is one of Portia's pieces, right? This, this, mm -hmm. how in sync and how connected um, all of these different flora and fauna species are and how important it is to be aware of what you're planting and what, 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 how that has an effect on, on all the different species. So I know some questions are coming through on the chat. Um, so one question that came through from our president, Sean Sawyer, uh, the president of the Olana Partnership, is he said that he's struck by the contrast in Porsche's plastic assemblages between the environmental tragedy of mass produced plastic and what appears to be a celebration of color. So is this dichotomy intentional? Hmm. Well, I, I mean, I would hope that all of the work would be seen as kind of having a beautiful aspect to it, even the plastic work. I'm trying to make it so that you want to look at it and want to think about it. Mm -hmm. um, and the plastic work is all colorful. But um, yeah, and they're also kind of, in a way, they're sort of all a little bit about the death of nature or the mm -hmm. death of us in a in a kind of way like they're 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 both like celebrating um in some way but then also talking about um you know our own sort of demise mm -hmm. i would say something like that um mm -hmm. yeah there i think it's just i think the common theme for me is that i'm really i'm just looking and gathering from the world around me and it's all different things that i'm that i'm finding and responding to Mm -hmm. And taking and, part, oh no, go for it, yeah. Well, I was gonna actually sort of uh, change the subject slightly. Um, I was thinking back to the last question and um, Catherine's um, answers. And I just wanted to add something to that, which was um, that I recently found an injured uh, hawk, a juvenile red-tailed hawk, and I brought it to a local rehabilitator, uh, animal rehabilitator, which is a really, is a really good thing to do if anybody finds an injured um, creature, and I can share some of those links that you can you can um, put on your you know share with people. But the thing that I learned that I was so surprised about was how uh, lead poisoning is still a really big thing for um, for birds. I guess it's I mean Catherine would would know better than me, but maybe it's for the larger birds that eat fish or things that come out of you know, water, I don't, I don't know, but it, I was like really shocked to hear that all the different birds that are brought to the rehabilitators, they test them. And um, so many of them have uh, lead poisoning as one of their complications. Yes, uh, here in New York State, we still allow lead shot and hunters use, use lead shot and they kill deer and the deer carcasses are out there in the mm -hmm. environment and they're ingested by eagles and and other birds that feed on carrion. And there's also a fair amount of lead that goes into ponds and lead sinkers in fishing, for fishing gear. And those are scarfed up by uh, animals that feed on, feed on, like balloons, for example, and just a fair amount of lead from the bottom of the ponds when they're eating fish and the like. So yeah, that's still a big problem that I think, and I, I feel pretty strongly that DC has been very, very slow to adopt alternative forms of shot. The, their argument is that there's large amounts of ammunition out there and it will be a long, long time before the lead that's already been produced will be used up. Mm. Mm. Wow, just another kind of 
proof of our points, some of the points that we've talked about of how interconnected everything is. A question came through from um, Liz, our wonderful education coordinator. And she's wondering, um, a lot of Porsche's work, early work uses plastic items and both, and, and then later items from nature with both bodies of work fo focusing on colors and patterns. Um, she's commenting that it's a quite an interesting evolution, but she's interested if either of you can talk a little bit about any man-made items or inventions that you've seen that are helping animals. So kind of inverting this, this notion of um, man-made product and consumerism affecting the natural world. Has there been any kind of beneficial inventions or products that you know of? Well, the, I would just reiterate what I have seen, which are these um, these animal um, pathways that that they that they do in some countries and some places where you can make um, you know walkways under or over highways for for and they they're kind of beautiful, like making a natural place where the creatures can pass over or below, and I I think that's really that's really wonderful. That's the first thing that pops into my mind. But um, Catherine. I don't, you. I'm trying to think most of the things that I can think of have been invented to mitigate the damage we've already done. So, <laughs> so things like these decals that you can put on glass windows mm -hmm. to help birds not see, you know, see it as habitat is one thing that's been done. It's fairly successful. There are a lot of big glass buildings out there that grow an awful lot of birds. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, which we really, I think, I think it would be great if I'm hope I'm hope I'm always hopeful for the next generation. Like the next generation of architects can really be very um, inventive, and in, you know what they're what they're how they deal with how they deal with that um, that huge problem of the glass windows. And and I think that what Catherine said before about planting um, native species. I mean that's something that is it's not an invention, but you see more and more. Uh, garden centers and places where you can purchase plants where they're they'll feature native species and that's that's really great to try to do that mm -hmm. in your gardens yeah it strikes me that so much of this um question you know about human how to mitigate human intervention how to mitigate some of our human effect of the climate is is the solution is human design you know thinking more about how we can design structures and places and roads to be more habitable for other species. Um, uh, so a little bit of an unrelated question that's come through on the chat is from Sean Sawyer. To what degree has art history inspired Porsche's work? I'm thinking of the iconography of flowers and skulls in Dutch still life paintings in particular, the memento mori's in particular. So I'd love to hear a little bit more about that Porsche. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I feel like uh, I love like the Dutch still lifes and I feel like what those artists were doing is they were documenting what was around them. Like they were mm -hmm. documenting their world at that time. And so I feel like that's something that I'm trying to do with, with all of my work. I'm documenting our world right now as I see it, whether it's the, the nature imagery or the plastic things, it's like what's, you know, I'm sort of making different still lives, different documents about right now. Um, so they've been a really big influence. Um, yeah, I mean, there, there, there are many, many influences, but maybe I'll just keep it short like that. Well, what are some other, no, I'm curious to hear, what are some other influences for the Memento, the Memento Mori specifically? Um, well, I do, I mean, I, I feel, I, I was actually in a, in a, I mean, it's gonna sound so cliche to say this, but I was really very in, influenced by Frida Kahlo. She was an artist who, when I went to art school, was basically unknown. I mean, I remember one professor who had known her talking about, known her and Diego Rivera, had talked about Diego Rivera's wife and how she was really mm -hmm. a very interesting artist. And then shortly after that, the very first book on her came out. And there were things in her work that, as a, you know, as a really young artist, were quite, were quite inspiring like how she with her work I mean her work was very personal about a lot of it was about her own personal pain but she was also very much looking at um, animals and flowers and things around her and you know and really even though she had pain in her life it was very much also about beauty and so I really um, I feel like I'm, I'm often trying to do that like trying to show things that are maybe painful or uncomfortable 
but also like um, sort of draw you in by like the beautiful aspect of it. Mm -hmm. That duality. Yeah. And I feel like that duality, I mean, that duality of the beauty and the, and the more kind of grisly or even poignant and mournful aspects of nature. I mean, I imagine Catherine, that's something that you kind of come across in your work often. I don't know if you have any, anything to comment on that, but it's interesting to think about how that's such a, such a driving force of, of many artists, but I imagine it's something that, I mean, it comes across in all of our lives, especially if you're interacting with the natural world so intimately. I, I don't think anybody studied birds for as long as I have and not become a conservationist. It's just <laughs> so obvious to, some, to someone with a, more than a few years experience that, uh, that there are, we have tremendous impacts on these organisms and, and uh, we need to, I think we need to learn to cohabit with most of nature. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, wonderful. Well, I just want to make sure we have about two more minutes for any other questions that anyone has. Um, but I had one more question because I feel like there was one um, kind of buzzword for our conversation today that didn't come up, which is taxonomy and how important that is to both of your your practices and your lines of work. Um, I know it came up a little bit for you, Portia, but I would love to hear more about kind of where's the power, where do you see the power in taxonomy? It's something that I know, um, you know, scientists and theorists in the 19th century were thinking a lot about. It's something that comes into your work and it's something that's vital to Catherine's work. So I would just love to hear your thoughts on, on that. Um, Catherine, do you wanna start? Well, we, we like to classify things. We like to organize things. I mean, it doesn't matter what it is really, but, but that, that tension for organization is something that is throughout the mm -hmm. uh, natural world. And this is why we have museums with collections and. And the birds that you collect that I hope they often end up in collections because possessing mm -hmm. dead birds is not, not mm -hmm. legal for starters, but, but um, those dead birds contribute to our knowledge of, of, of and science as well. Even there are studies even now, the DNA studies that are being done are using, I mean, they have stuffed uh, Carolina parakeets, which have long been extinct in New York State. They're able to do DNA analysis because they can take cells out of the toes of dead birds that are 100 years old and actually figure out who, the, who they're related to based on DNA studies. Who would ever have guessed that 100-year-old dead birds could make a contribution? But they certainly mm -hmm. are as new scientific techniques are developed. Mm -hmm. and, mm -hmm. and classifying and understanding relationships mm -hmm. in nature is just critically important to almost any kind of work that we do. Yeah, it occurs to me that there's this great, you know, there's this great possibility in terms of categorizing, but there's also limitations too. It's this interesting, you know, we talked a little bit about duality and I, I, I think it's something that um, has that kind of shared shared association for, to my mind as well. But hearing about that, Catherine, that's fascinating. Yeah, mm -hmm. sure. yeah I've, I've tried to, um, uh, I've, I've shared many of the birds, I've given many of the birds that I've found to, um, uh, I'm sort of spacing out on the name of the um, of the retired now retired professor who started it, but it's a collection of birds at the Columbia Green um, College. College, Bill Cook. Mm -hmm. Bill and Cook. yeah, Bill Cook, mm -hmm. and uh, and I believe that he through through just local people finding birds and donating them to his collection uh, that he just dis discovered sort of a subspecies of one type of bird. Um, I don't remember what that was, but I remember when I visited being shown these different things and there are people who come from all over and will research and use mm -hmm. that as a resource. And um, it's, you know, it's an important, it is a really important history um, to have these, these collections. I think he calls them bird skins or something like that, wow. these, these, these yes. collections. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So um, yeah, it seems like a really, a really great, important thing. One, one other thing that just came to mind that was very inspiring to me in terms of like artwork and something that is kind of combining science and art is the, um, the glass flower connect collection mm -hmm. that's at um, Harvard. Mm -hmm. And that is a really fabulous thing to go and look at and think about. And that was some, these incredible examples of flowers that were made out of glass and 
from really, you know, from a scientist, but they're very artistic, like really thinking about um, how the flowers are made and what they look like. And that's, that's just like kind of a mind blowing, beautiful crossing of science and art. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and for those of you who haven't yet been to Alana to see Portia's work in person, I encourage you to come visit our exhibition, Cross Pollination, which is in collaboration with the Thomas Cole National Historic Site, will be opening this weekend. So please definitely come to both of our sites and come see the wonderful work on view. We have some beautiful um, you know, contemporary and 19th century pieces, and it, it all kind of examines some of what we've been talking a little bit about today. So thank you both so much for this great conversation. I definitely feel like I've I have a call to action and I have some um, some ways that I can kind of mitigate some of the, the damage and the destruction of the habitats for birds and other species in our communities. So thank you both.